Welcome everyone, I hope you're ready for this. I'm always looking to hear your experiences, so if you have a story you'd like me to read in an upcoming video, please send it to the email in the description. Now, on to the stories. I live in Southern Oregon, a beautiful place in the west, filled with some of the most beautiful forests one will ever see. The national forest that I live against I know like the back of my hand. I know stories from long ago about places in the middle of nowhere that have strange names, and that often draws me to these places to explore and feel nostalgic. These forests also have things about them that are off. Locals talk about how people disappear all the time in the woods, sometimes over drugs, sometimes over foul play, and other times people just go for a hunt or a hike and are never seen again, disappear without a trace. I've spent years in the deep wilderness hiking, almost every day. The incident I'm about to tell you changed how I felt about the forest. My roommate and I left our home on the outskirts of the forest, in a bowl-like canyon, high up in the mountains. There's one road in and one road out. As we climbed the mountain, the rain had started to pick up. It had been mostly drizzle that day, but living in the Pacific Northwest, you get used to that and it doesn't stop you from adventure. We finally get to the flats and it's time to explore. We walk the trail into the flats, and as we admire the old growth trees surrounding the marsh, the wind starts to pick up. There was a nasty storm coming in. The trees started to rock back and forth and make horrible snapping sounds, and there aren't many safe places in a forest like this to take shelter from falling trees and branches, so we decided it was time to hike out. We hiked back to the car, and were relieved to get in it and out of the storm. The car was parked in a small turnout on the side of the road. We sat there for a few moments in the car, taking off our jackets and turning the heat on and such. That's when the truck pulled up, in the middle of a bad storm, in the complete middle of nowhere. A really old beat up pickup truck drives up and parks in front of our car, not completely blocking the car, but coming damn near close, a burly man steps out of the driver's seat and turns and looks at us. I have to say, this is the only time in my entire life that I have thought to myself, something here isn't right. The look on this guy's face gave me that instinctual feeling of fight or flight. As we watch him walk around his truck, I tell my roommate, go, just go. Start the car and leave, now. As he starts the car and begins to pull off, the man was reaching behind the seat of his truck and pulls out a long rifle. That's when my roommate hit the gas and flew out of there. As we pull away, the man pulls the gun out and points it in our direction and looks me right in the eyes. And the feeling I got was, you were going to die today. I will never, ever forget the look on his face. We got home, told our neighbors about the incident, and proceeded about our day. When we got into the car the next morning to drive to town, the starter failed on the car. I often think to myself, had it failed up there, or had that bad storm not come in and shoot us away, things could very well have gone south that day. I live in a small town in South Africa. Near my town, there's a large patch of woods, and since the pandemic, I haven't been in the woods for a long time. Until yesterday. So, my friend called me to ask if I wanted to join him and a few other mates to play a game of paintball in the woods. And obviously, I was keen. I got my paintball gear and gun and headed off to my mate's place. There were six of us, Chase, Liam, Matt, Joey, Stephen, and obviously me. 
We headed off to the woods, but made a few stops to fill up on petrol and get some gas for the paintball guns. When we finally got to the woods, we parked the cars, got in our gear, and ventured out in the forest to find the perfect spot to paintball. Eventually we got deep enough and to an area with sufficient cover and space to play a good game of capture the flag. We played a couple of games and since it's winter, it got dark really quickly. But we planned for this and brought our flashlights and decided to play a couple of night games, which is extremely hard, especially in the forest we were in. During one match, Joey and I decided to sit out because we were both tired and just needed a quick breather and the others continued to play from a significantly good distance away from us. While we were chilling, I was rolling up a joint and Joey went to go take a piss a couple of meters away from me. While I was busy rolling, I had the flashlight pointing towards myself since there was no other light to allow me to see what I was doing and around me, it was completely dark. I couldn't even see two meters ahead of myself because of how dark it was. Suddenly I heard footsteps coming my way, but I thought it was Joey, and I soon realized I couldn't see any light from his flashlight. So now I was more vigilant, but still relaxed, thinking he's trying to play a prank on me or something. But the footsteps stopped a few meters away from me, so I lifted up my flashlight and pointed it in the direction where I heard the footsteps. I scanned the area, but just saw bushes and trees. I thought it might be Joey hiding in the bushes or behind a tree, waiting to give me a jump scare. Then I heard footsteps coming in the opposite direction, and when I looked, I could see it was Joey because he was holding his flashlight. That's when I stopped what I was doing and picked up my flashlight and paintball gun. And when Joey reached me, I whispered, Bro, I think there's someone over there. And Joey obviously didn't believe me. He just said to me to stop being a baby. But he soon regretted saying that because I decided to do one last scan of where I heard the footsteps. And, to my horror, I saw someone peeking and staring right at me from behind a tree probably 10 or 11 meters away from us. I just shouted, what the actual fuck? And when Joey heard me say this, he looked at me and then to the man. He instantly jumped up, picking up his paintball gun. We stared at each other for at least two minutes, but it felt like forever until he stepped out from behind the tree. He was a large man, at least six foot, was honestly filthy, like he hadn't taken a bath in years. He was wearing baggy, ripped up jeans, and just an old, dirty, zipped up bomber jacket. Plus, we could see he was on something, or he was just batshit crazy, and he was holding something behind his back. He finally said, what are you guys doing out here when it's so dark? We couldn't even answer him because of the shock we were in. Joey stuttered with fear in his voice. We, uh, we were just leaving. But the man nodded his head in disagreement and said, No, you're not. Your friends are still playing the game. I felt a shiver down my spine. How about we play a game of our own while we wait for your friends? And that's when he finally showed us what he was hiding behind his back. It was a large machete. That's when I knew we had to get out of there. So I aimed my paintball gun, and in the toughest way I could muster up, I told him, Leave now, or I will shoot. Even though I only had about six or seven paintballs loaded. And Joey did the same thing by aiming his gun at the man even though he had no paintballs in his gun. But he didn't even flinch, but did something that honestly made my skin crawl. He just smiled and said, The game starts now. And suddenly he just rushed at us. So I told Joey to run while I fired my last bullets at him, 
and luckily I shot him in his head, which caused him to fall. So that was our chance to book it and link up with our other friends. As soon as we started running, we heard his footsteps again, and he was actually gaining on us. We could barely see, but we couldn't slow down because we knew what would happen if we did. We just carried on sprinting our hearts out until we heard other paintball guns being fired, so we knew we were close. Joey started shouting to get everyone's attention, and all of a sudden, I hear a huge thud. Joey tripped and twisted his ankle. I turned around to help him up, and when I did, I could see the man running full sprint towards us. In that moment, I thought it was going to be the end for us, but our friends heard our screams for help and rushed to us, and when they saw the man, they just started firing at him. He knew he wasn't going to be able to take us all on, so we decided to turn around and disappear into the forest. We helped Joey up, rushed to get our stuff, and rushed to the cars. When we got to my friend's place, we helped Joey treat his ankle, and I proceeded to tell my friends everything that happened, and they were all creeped out. It's safe to say that the next time in those woods, I will be more vigilant. I work for my city's water department. My everyday job consists of repairing leaks or doing new installations for businesses and homes. There are two parts to our water department that keep everything running. Distribution, where I normally work, and production. Production deals with the chemical side of things. They chlorinate the water and do water sample checks. Production is also responsible for the upkeep of our water well sites and our water storage facilities. Mowing grass is one of those responsibilities. Both parts of our department are extremely understaffed right now, so we sometimes give the production guys a hand with the grass when they need it. A couple of weeks ago, it was my turn, and here is where the weirdness begins. My city is central Louisiana, with a population of about 45,000 people. We're surrounded by wooded area. No matter which way you travel into or out of town, you're going to see plenty of trees. As such, a lot of our well sites are located out in the boonies. Most of our city trucks are four-wheel drive with mud grips because it's needed more often than not. I had four sites to cut that day. I headed out just before sunrise to the one at the end of a long dirt road, where if trouble strikes, your phone better be charged because no one is going to be able to hear you yell for help. The sun was rising as I was approaching my first sight, and on the road ahead of me stepped out a doe with her two fawns. Excitedly, I hurried to snap some pictures. To my surprise, the mama and her babies were not afraid of the loud rumbling diesel I was driving. The speckled fawns made their way across the path as the mom calmly watched me in the truck. Once the babies were safely across, she looked back the way she came and then joined the little ones in the tree line on the opposite side of the road. I breezed through my mowing, loaded the equipment back onto the trailer, and texted my mom the pictures of the deer as I headed back into town. My mom messaged me back, saying, I've read that deer are an omen of good fortune. Looks like you're gonna have a great day. Be safe. I love you. And I did have a great day. I knocked out the next two sites without issue, and everything was going smooth. Until I reached the gate of the last place I had to mow. McKeithen's site is the biggest one we have that's closer to town. It's about the size of a football field. It's not in the middle of nowhere, but it is on the outskirts of the city. There's normally plenty of traffic that travels the road there, so there's really no feeling of seclusion, even though it's surrounded by thick woods on three sides. I've cut this spot plenty of times, 
But that day felt different. I pulled the truck through and hopped out to lock the gate behind me. Immediately, I felt like I needed to get back into the truck as quick as possible. I made my way down the driveway to park near the tower, like I have many times before. But after I parked and killed the truck, everything felt heavy and silent. I don't know how long I sat until I was able to will myself to open the door and get out. Instantly, I felt eyes on me. The feeling was coming from the back right corner of the field outside of the fence, just in the tree line where the palmetto bushes grow. I calmed my nerves and reminded myself that I was surrounded by an eight-foot, inclimbable fence with the gate locked. Yeah, if someone had a gun, they could have shot me if they wanted to, but they weren't actually going to get to me. If the barbed wire at the top of the fence didn't get them, a face full of weed eater string would. I jumped on the zero turn and took off mowing, keeping an eye on the back corner during every pass. After about two hours, I had the entire front mowed, and it was time to hit the back by the creepy corner. I was about to head that way, but the mower blades wouldn't engage. I had to take covers off pull grass out of the belts, and out from under the deck. I had to grease the pulleys and do all sorts of troubleshooting. I finally got the blades going, but then the gas light came on. I didn't realize it until later, but it felt like something was doing everything it could to keep me from going to that part of the lot. I finally got everything up and running and mowed the back as quick as possible doing everything I could to keep my sight on the fence. I finally got done and loaded the mower. I still had to do a little bit of weed eating around the area, but when the weed eater wouldn't start, I knew it was time to go. I hadn't had an issue with it all day, but that was the last hint that I needed to get out of there. After pulling out of the gate and locking it behind me, I turned out onto the highway to head home, but not before looking at the back corner one last time. That's when I finally saw it. The unmistakable shadow of a figure standing in the palmettos. It wasn't trying to hide or make itself unseen. It was there. Being a safe distance from it, I stopped and watched. It moved to the side, as if bending to try to see me better at the road. It had no distinguishable features, no hair, no clothes, just a person-shaped mass. I decided I had to get as far away from there as I could. The thought that I'd been so close to it for so long and never saw it sent chills to my core. I called my mom later that night and told her what had happened. She told me that she did some morning reading about seeing the deer and learned that they are a sign of protection, that some people believe that a deer means that a higher power is watching over you. After my mom told me that, I couldn't help but think, what if I had not seen the deer that morning? Would I have even seen the shadow? Would it have been able to do something to me? Why did it choose to show itself to me? Is it something about me, or is it tied to that part of the woods? My mom texted me even later that night. She was sitting out on her back steps in my old little hometown when she heard some rustling near her storage shed. She shone her light into the dark, and what stands there but a deer? Deer had never come into the backyard before, but that night, a large deer stood tall staring back at my mom. She told me she felt like it was there, as if to say, it's okay, he's safe, don't worry, we got him. This happened to my roommate and I two years ago when we drove into the national forest just outside of the town we live in. 
We go to a small college in New England, about three hours from any major city. For context, this forest has quite a few urban legends surrounding it, and the local community, although they do go there often, have a lot of superstitions about how to be safe while there. I had just broken up with my partner, and my roommate could sense I was feeling down. Finals were just around the corner, so she decided to help me get my mind off of things, and suggested we go to a nice spot she'd found last week, and just chill and de-stress. We took a couple of beers with us and drove to this secluded spot in the forest. From the moment we left the main asphalt road in the forest, I saw a couple of things that unsettled me. You could see the abandoned houses of a ghost town from the higher ground the road was on, and we saw this old doll hanging from a rope on a tree. Creepy shit, but we didn't really give it a second thought and kept driving. We got to a clearing and parked our car behind some trees, popped open the back of our SUV, and started just talking and playing music. About ten minutes into this, two cars appeared from the road and parked in the clearing. My friend didn't pay them attention. Instead, she kept talking. But as I was facing them from where I sat, I couldn't stop seeing what they did. A guy popped out of each car, talked for a few minutes, and then I saw them take out a long object covered in a dark plastic bag from the back of one of their cars. This is when I had noticed these guys had guns, and not like shotguns, which I often see in this town, but handguns. Then they started lighting the bag on fire. I told my friend to get down, and she turned around and saw them for the first time. Black smoke was rising from the bag, and between trying to keep my head down and steal glances at them, I saw them take out a second object and heard them shoot at it, right before they set it on fire. I don't know how long my friend and I were lying there in silence, but it was definitely enough to let the terror sink in, and whisper how much we loved each other, in case this was what we thought it was. At some point I looked up and saw that they were pointing at our car. I saw them walking into the woods maybe trying to follow our tracks or trying to look for us. All I know is that right then, I told my friend to jump into the driver's seat and make a run for it. I shut the back door, and between that and the car starting up, the guys heard it and started running towards us, then ran towards one of their cars and hopped in. We went over a hill and drove way above what was safe for dirt roads on a hillside but we lost them. We drove to a neighboring town and roamed around for a while, just to make sure no one was following us before we went back to our dorm. That day, we tried to make fun of the whole situation and got really drunk before finally breaking down and crying from knowing we'd seen something we were not supposed to. We were at first terrified of telling anyone, but eventually did tell officers on campus who contacted the police, but they never found anything. This story takes place when I was about 13 years old. I just moved into a small countryside town, into a house that was just beside a huge forest. It was a new neighborhood, and there weren't really many houses on my street. You could, without a doubt, walk hours into the woods and still be going. Being young and stupid, I'd take my dog for a walk without having my parents with me or anything to protect me. Don't blame my parents. They were reassured by the fact that my dog was really big, and people were easily frightened by him. My dog was about seven years old. I did that often, nothing bad ever happened to me, and I never met anyone there. I loved it, because I could really take my mind off of everything else that was happening in my life. The moving was rough on me, and to make everything more fun, 
I was being bullied at school, so I really needed that. So there I was, casually walking on a track that is across the wood that's used for motocross and quad bikes. A noise that I didn't pay too much attention to at first was coming from behind me, and it started to get louder. When I turned back, I can see a person coming straight at me on his motorcycle. I'm a 13-year-old girl who's scared of everything that seems out of the ordinary. So, I decide to get off the track as quickly as I can to hide. Unfortunately for me, Henry is a black dog and does not blend well with the surroundings, as everything was green and it was the middle of the day. I walk pretty fast, but I can tell that the bike was closer and I stood out. I started running and found a rock that was big enough to hide my dog and I. I heard the motocross come and go. It was impossible for the person to see us really. I waited, telling myself that I was being silly. When I thought I waited long enough, I started walking again. I froze instantly when I heard that the engine was suddenly so close to me. Without hesitation, I started running like hell, and when I was able to stop and hide, I did. My dog wasn't in the best shape, and I was feeling so bad for him for making him run that much. I could tell the bike was getting closer and closer to me. It wasn't a very dense forest, so he could follow. He was so much faster than me. Now, I'm a clumsy person. I trip on about everything I can. So when I did meet this lovely branch, I fell on the ground pretty hard after tripping on it, but I think I was so full of adrenaline that I just got up and started running again. He was meters from me, so I knew he could see me, and he is clearly chasing me. There was no doubt in my mind that if he gets me, something really bad could happen to me. We were approaching a more dense part of the forest, so the guy had no choice but to stop. It gave me an advantage over him. I was able to get away. I was so glad when I saw a house. It was under construction, so nobody lived in it. I found a hiding spot behind the fence. Minutes later, I saw the bike pass and it stopped in front of me. He was searching for me and it was clear he couldn't see me. I felt this huge relief when he started to ride away. I think I hid for about 30 to 40 minutes without moving to make sure he did not come back. I did find my way home and told my parents about it, but they thought I was being dramatic. In the end, I never found out who this person was. I did hurt myself, but it was nothing too serious. I heard years later about weed that was being grown in a part of the woods, and cameras. Maybe I got too close or something and they saw me on the cameras. I also went with some friends of mine when I was older, and we found a small abandoned house that was not too far away from where this happened. To save up money, I'm currently taking on odd jobs, several of which have gone completely fine, except for this one time. For a bit of backstory, I messaged this guy about his listing, about needing his house exterior painted. We talk back and forth and agree. I plan to travel by train and public transport. I got delayed like two to three hours, but showed up, and it was late. It was 8 in the evening when I arrived, and he knew it would be late before I showed up. And in addition to him being okay with me showing up late in the day, he suggested and said to me, Okay, you can still come, but you'd have to come back one more time tomorrow in order to complete the painting. No suggestion whatsoever about sleeping over, and he knew the general area I traveled from, and that it was 48-ish kilometers away. I pull up to his house and I'm greeted by him, and nothing seems out of the ordinary. But I did think, he sure looks older than he texts. I was expecting maybe someone in their late 20s to early 30s. 
This guy was definitely in his fifties. He greeted me while smoking a cigarette, puffing on it with his other hand while his free hand shook mine. We chit-chat briefly, then he shows me the back of his house, where he's rigged up the painting equipment and we discuss the work. He mentioned having a girlfriend over text, but I thought it was weird I didn't see her there. At every other job like this, I've been at the people in the background who didn't list the job make their presence known and at least say hi. But it was just him, and I couldn't hear him talk to anyone else there either. I left my bag with my personal belongings in the front, and I'm going to begin painting at the back side. I walk back around to charge up my battery pack. He then asks me, as if my answer didn't matter, You want to smoke? As he walks towards me, holding up a packet of cigarettes, with one cigarette extending out, kind of shaking it at me, like, Here, here. I tell him, No, thank you. You don't want a cigarette. I tell him, No, I don't smoke. And then he asks me, Do you want a beer? I politely decline and tell him that I don't drink. He then asks me if I want a soda. At this point, he's being a bit pushy, but I tell him, no, thank you, but really, I don't accept drinks from strangers, at least until they gain my trust as a precaution, not because I had my guard up with him necessarily. In that moment, he just felt annoying, more so than suspicious. I go back around to paint for a few, then I come back to get something out of my bag. As I kneel down, he comes at me from my blind spot holding out a whole bottle of a one-liter Coca-Cola, telling me, here's the soda if you want some, while he tries to hand it to me. At this point, I know something isn't right, because I know he heard me say no to the soda the first time. Why is he being this pushy? This time, when I head to the back, I bring my bag of personal belongings with me to the back area, and I kind of want to get out of there. It's getting late, and I'm not 100% sure when the next or last bus or train's going to be. So I walk back to the front, and he's sitting on a chair or something in the front of his shed, which is located in front of his house. So I tell him I'll paint another hour maximum, and then I'll be heading home. I don't remember a lot of the conversation, because I was creeped the fuck out just moments later. But when I said that, he kinda nonchalantly brushes off the prospect of me heading home. He suggests, almost instructing me, to sleep over and spend the night in his guest bedroom, where he says he set up a camping bed or some shit like that. He proposes this very matter-of-factly. I say, no, it's okay, I'll just come back tomorrow. He then double downs and continues, yeah, but how are you going to travel back and forth for so long? Just sleep over. I've set up a camping bag and everything for you that you can use. He points towards his open house door. Just go in the living room there and go up the stairs and see. But be careful of the floor, because I painted some of it. It's still wet, so mind your step. In my mind, I'm like, oh shit, I know I gotta get out of here ASAP. Why the fuck is he insisting repeatedly and so adamantly that I sleep over? Especially after I've said no. I tell him, Oh no, I'm not planning to sleep over. He says, Not sleeping over. And he stands up from his chair, almost in disbelief, and tries to talk me into sleeping over, saying traveling here takes five to eight hours, and it's very expensive. Yada yada yada. Trying to discourage me, and then he adds, at least go inside and take a look at what I've set up for you, and then you can make your mind up. I shut him down and said, No, it actually takes an hour and forty minutes one way. I was just late because I got off at the wrong stop. The time is not a problem, and no, it's not expensive. It costs around twenty dollars max. It's not a problem, because the painting job will pay me seven hundred. Is that so? He says, yeah, and look, 
I'm not sleeping over, I replied. Then, the whole time as we're talking, I've noticed that he's looking very hard at me, focusing almost. He's staring while talking. I can tell he's upset with my answer, and I get this eerie feeling of him not having gotten his way, and I can just feel he's going to attempt something to make me stay. Already, his body language is a bit different. He then asks me a ton of questions about which bus and train I'll be taking home, which stop I'll go to, when the bus leaves me, and he also asked me if I've even checked when the last bus leaves. Truth be told, I wasn't exactly sure when the next bus left, or if a bus would even be here in an hour. I was 21 at this point. Me not knowing differently shook me, and I tried to answer as vague as possible. Yeah, I'll just take whatever bus goes around an hour from now. Like nearby to here, yeah. Or something vague like that. The way he asked those questions was very off, and my gut feeling told me not to give him any specific information. And besides, at this point, I wanted to get off the subject of how I was getting home, so I could begin distracting him by assuring him I'll continue to paint and discussing the next steps. Keep in mind, within him suggesting me sleep over, I've already began mentally planning how to dip and get the hell out of there ASAP, but sneakily. The thing is, I need my bag of personal belongings first at the back of the house, especially my phone, because no one I know knows where I'm at, so I have to play along like I'm not leaving and play off that I'm not suspicious of him. I plan to chit-chat about my plans for the painting job, Discuss painting approaches to distract him, while I get close enough to my back to reach for it and dip. I also am in the middle of nowhere almost. Countryside city, no neighbors outside who can see me. It's getting late. I'm not sure how or when I'll get home, and I'm getting in my head about all of it at the same time. His body language is just creepy, like I can sense he's locking in on me and see this in my side vision as I walk to the back. He's following me, not walking with me. He's entering my personal space very unnaturally. He says he would have driven me if only he had a driver's license, and says via his taxi app he can pay for my taxi, because he gets a discount, and I feel like he's adding a lot of unnecessary details to his sentences, as if he's trying to distract me. I say, Oh, okay, yeah, I see. To his taxi and license speech. I come to a standstill, and I'm facing him. He's about two to three meters away from me, but I kind of have my head turned toward the house to my right, and I point at it while talking about the paint. I notice that he's still staring at me, not looking towards where I'm pointing. He's standing totally still, facing me. I forget exactly what was said at this point, because out of nowhere, he lunges towards me while not breaking eye contact, staring me dead in the eyes with this creepy grin and predator eyes, big, fast steps. But because I was focused and alert, I instinctively walked backwards. He kind of continued after me, but stopped. I don't think he expected me to back away from him. He stood where I would be standing maybe a bit further past it. Now, the craziest part, he didn't even acknowledge or address what he did, nor my reaction to it, and I was visibly spooked. He didn't even try to play it off like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. He was still staring, and still had that creepy fucking grin on his face, completely unchanged expression, and as he lunged towards me, I made out a big scar on his forehead I didn't notice before. A Harry Potter-esque scar across his forehead. Scary stuff. You only move like that when you want to subdue someone. Grab someone. I'm so scared at this point and full of adrenaline, but I blurt out, in an attempt to still not seem suspicious of him. That gave me goosebumps. Goosebumps? Well, he says and I talk about the wall and paint again to distract him 
or even to buy time, and he has this defeated demeanor, almost like his body language and tone is saying, ah, almost hurt him. I wasn't going to fight him either, because I don't know if he had a knife, a gun, a fucking chloroform rack or tranquilizing syringes. I'm not going to risk anything. I still didn't have my phone or belongings, so I needed to distract him some more. I play off that I'm going to paint, and that before I paint, I need him to look for a piece of equipment for me while I grab the paintbrush and make like I'm going to pick up where I left off, assuring him that I'm going to paint until he goes around the corner. That's when I grab my phone as fast as I can out of my bag and text my best friend and my girlfriend my location and that I'm bailing the fuck out of there and that I need them to stay on the line. I then rush towards the gate and run. I take a few turns so he can't see me in case he was going to follow me so I could shake him off. I'm also not familiar at all in this city, so I'm Google mapping while I'm taking off. This guy texted me an hour later after I left, saying, Hey, did you leave? You forgot your battery pack. You'll get that back tomorrow when you show up. Prior to all this, we agreed to continue the work on Monday, and he offered to take my wireless charging pack inside his house to charge it for me. The fact he acts like nothing happened is wild. It struck me as odd when I look back through our exchanges that even though I'd be late, never once did he suggest sleeping over, not one time. He even suggested I should leave and come back twice to finish the job. I also thought it was weird he didn't have a driver's license because there's not a lot of public transport out there. It's in the countryside and he seemed to live relatively well off. I guess maybe it could have gotten taken away from him. I checked out his social media later when I came back home. He 100% gives off the energy of a creepy fuck who hasn't been caught and tries to act normal outwardly. He sure looks the part as well. And by part, I mean the creepy fuck part. This happened a couple of months back. My housemates were on a night out, and I decided to stay in and watch a movie with my boyfriend. At midnight, someone knocked on the door. I answered, assuming it was one of my housemates, and it was this young guy who must have been around 18 to 21 years old. I asked him if he was okay, and he told me that he lost one of his airpods behind my house and in my garden. He asked if I would help him look for it. The student house had a backyard with a very high brick wall. There wasn't even a walkway behind the back of the houses, just a little path to a shop's garage a couple of garden gates down. I immediately had an awful feeling about him. He didn't look threatening at all and was about my height, roughly five foot six, but it didn't feel right. He couldn't have been in my garden. And why was he back there anyway? It's not a walkway. There was just no justifiable reason as to how he could have lost his airpod there. I started questioning him, but not too harshly. What do you mean you've lost your earphone? You can't have lost it in my garden. Why were you back there? How did you get access? I don't understand. Whilst this was going on, I felt like he was trying to get into the house because he kept moving forward. My boyfriend eventually came out of the living room, and the guy at the door kept asking us to help him look, and specifically for me to get my housemates. My boyfriend was about to help him, but I'd half hidden myself behind the door and gave him a death stare. I did not want my boyfriend to help him. My boyfriend ended up saying something along the lines of, hope you can find your earphones sorry about this, to the guy. The guy aggressively responds, so you're not going to help me. My boyfriend said, no, shut the door, and that was it. It really spooked me, and it left me with so many questions. 
I'm not close with my housemates, but I let them all know what happened, and none of them knew the guy. I'm very intuitive, so I still believe something sinister and weird was going on. I was laying in bed and my girlfriend shakes me and says, there's someone at the window. Sure enough, half a second later a shape walks past the window. I looked out the window and there's this man, just standing there, staring in our window. Instantly I'm on high alert. My brother comes out of his room and is like, yeah, I see him too. We keep an eye on him. He walks around our windows, just looking in, scratching his chin, trying to look casual. He noticed us looking at him and wandered away, and then came right back. Let's make this clear, this is an area that no one walks around in, even during the day. This was not a mistake of someone locked out or having a smoke or something. He was there for a reason. I called the police and they sent out an officer. As soon as he pulled up, the creepy guy walked off again, casually. The officer flashed his light around and left, and lo and behold, the creepy guy shows back up, this time chilling in the bushes, wandering around, again, completely casually. So I called the police again, and they came in force, two cruisers and a bunch of officers on foot, flashlights in the works. The guy walked away as they rolled up again, and I haven't seen him since. Currently there's a cruiser parked outside, and one driving around. I haven't seen the creepy guy since, and hopefully never will again. I snapped some pictures, but because of the light from the entryway, they aren't great quality. If it was a mistake, why'd he run when the cops showed up, and why was he staring at our windows at midnight? Anyway, we aren't sleeping tonight. My mom lives in a trailer park somewhere in BFE. I've never had any problems with the neighbors. I mind my business. They mind their own. My mom's fiancé, on the other hand, being the social butterfly that he is, has to get to know everyone coming and going around the block. So earlier this year, we start seeing a new guy next door, living with what we thought was just a single mom and her child. I thought maybe it's a new boyfriend or something. Of course my mom's fiancé starts getting to know the newbie of the neighborhood, but the months coming, things start to get weird. Whenever my sister would go outside, She'd notice the new neighbor, Chris, would fly out of the back door to do random mundane things. She would notice him watching out the window quite often too, but we didn't pay any mind to her, because sometimes my sister can be very dramatic. My mom's fiancé used to let him use our water and water hose to water his gardens. I never understood why, but when we got the water bill back, it was over $200. He told him he can't continue to let him use it because things are so expensive anymore. He immediately got aggressive and tried to tell him we're the only ones who were using too much water, not him. We've never gotten a bill that high before since living there. Last week, I get a random friend request from the neighbor. Not thinking much of it, I approved it. My mom's fiancé lets me know that Chris talked about how pretty I was and asked him for Facebook information, but he acted like he didn't know if I had a Facebook or not. The realization kicks in that he went through hundreds of my mom's fiancé's friends on Facebook to find my profile. By this point, we've already been talking over Facebook, but it has been a friendly chat, so no harm. Plus, I figured he'd seen where I have a boyfriend, because my profile clearly states I'm in a relationship. I mentioned to Chris what my mom's fiancé said, and he said he wasn't going to sugarcoat anything, 
that he actually called me sexy as fuck. I let it be known I have a boyfriend and he apologizes. If you think that's the last time he's made a comment or pass, you're wrong. It's like he completely disregards I'm with someone. He even asked me to go into the woods with him, meet him outside at night, and just in general made me so uncomfortable. At this point, I'm over talking to him, but one crucial bit of information my mom's fiancé left out was that he just got out of prison some months ago for some really bad stuff. Breaking and entering, arson, name a few, and the worst one was manslaughter for shanking a man while he was serving his time. He claims it was self-defense. I have no idea how he's even walking freely right now, but I digress. So usually once a guy doesn't take the hint of, I have a boyfriend, I'd usually tell them to fuck off, block and be done, but my mother doesn't think that's the best course of action. I even brought up ghosting him, but she thinks that he could just walk right over here if he sees me out and confront me about leaving him on red. He's actually been caught walking through our yard trying to find me one day, so her theory is not far-fetched. My family and my boyfriend are terrified for me. My mom tells me I'm no longer allowed to go outside by myself. I'm just trying to save up enough to move away from here. Last night my family, boyfriend and I, were outside talking on the front porch, just hanging out. We started hearing yelling next door, and the creepy neighbor sped off in a truck. Then a few moments later, he came back, and we heard the woman screaming, Keep your hands off of me. Police were called, and more people showed up at the home. My mom, boyfriend, and I left to go to town. It was dark, but when we pulled up to the end of the street to get onto the main road, our headlights lit up a person on the side of the road. It was my creepy neighbor, clutching his phone, looking up the road. Today I found out he lied about being single and was cheating on the mother of his children. This poor woman has done everything for him, only for him to try and cheat on her with 16 other women. You can say his dirty ways caught up to him, and now she's kicked him to the curb. He's no longer living next door. As for the commotion we heard, I know she owns all the cars they have, so I'm guessing he tried to take off in one of them. She confronted him about all the dirty messages. She must have made him come back with it since it's here, so he brought it back and tried fighting her. He must have known someone was going to call the cops, so he ran on foot, given his record, and didn't want to go back to jail which is why we saw him at the end of the street, looking scared in the dark. I'm not sure if that's exactly what transpired, but based on everything I've heard from last night and from his ex herself today, this is my best guess. To the woman next door, I'm so sorry you and your family had to deal with this. You didn't deserve any of it. As for the creepy neighbor, good riddance and I hope you get what's coming to you. My family owns a boutique in a very big city here in the south. Our boutique is located in a very wealthy neighborhood, but that doesn't say much. If you go not even a mile north, south, west or east, you'll enter rough areas of the city. With that being said, we have a lot of homeless, drug addicts, and sketchy people in general come into our stores. When these people come in, we're also nice, respectful, and treat them just like we would our normal customers. However, we don't tolerate begging, stealing, or soliciting so we've all had our share of weird encounters at our store. However, I think my most recent encounter was the creepiest. Last week, getting ready to close, I was tidying up the store when a woman came in. 
I greeted her as normal, and everything seemed smooth sailing. She was looking around and engaging in conversation about some of our pieces, when all of a sudden, things changed quickly. The vibe and feeling of the room just felt eerie, so I moved behind the counter just to create a barrier. She began by grabbing one of our candles that has the saying, I love you to the moon and back, across the front of it. I think this is what originally triggered her. She began talking about her family and how she would read the book, I love you to the moon and back, to her triplets, that she didn't know she even had. She then started telling me about her life being married to Ryan Gosling and how she recently killed him because he kept poisoning her and hiding her three sets of triplets and daughter from her. At this point I was just listening. I didn't want to upset her any more than she already was. When she finished, she began walking the store again, telling me how she just got out of jail for stabbing someone. And at this point, she gets about four feet from my counter, tilts her head, looks me in the eye and says, I really feel like chopping you up right now. We were the only two in the store at the time, and I was in shock. I had no clue what was about to happen. Up until then, she was just rambling. This was the first instance of her showing aggression. Luckily, seconds after that statement, another customer one of my regulars came in, and the woman, who just told me she wanted to chop me up, grabbed her stuff and walked out the door. My regular could feel the tension as I rushed behind her and locked us in the store. The twins and I went to bed a while ago. I'm still recovering from COVID, so I fell asleep very quickly, and probably not entirely as quick thinking as usual. About half an hour ago, I woke up because someone was knocking on my front door. I came down and, my first mistake, opened the front door. A young man was there, asking about someone called James. I tried to tell him he got the wrong address. He carried on talking, and it was clear he wasn't talking about my brother. I told him again he had the wrong address, and he became quite aggressive. He said I was lying, and then asked me to let him in so he could charge his phone, then said, then I will show you I'm at the right house. I tried to close the door, and he blocked it with his foot. After a brief struggle, I managed to get the door shut. When I closed the door, he carried on knocking for a while and started yelling that he wasn't a scumbag and that I was treating him as such. He wasn't going to hurt me, he just wanted to charge his phone. Eventually he went away, but I'm really shaken up and feeling really vulnerable. I'm lucky because we have great neighbors and I know if they heard something, they would come running, but they clearly didn't hear this. How can I feel secure when there's only me and the kids in the house? We're taking self-defense classes, but I'm very aware that that night could have ended very differently if he'd gotten into the house. 24 hours after this, my neighbors had just found two guys hiding in their back garden. As soon as they were found, they ran for it. Their son grabbed one of them and now were waiting for the police. Their garden shares a fence with my garden. I don't recognize the lad who's been grabbed, but it is possible that his accomplice is the guy who tried to get in last night. Or it may be completely coincidental. The neighbor's son has a high-end motorcycle that's very desirable and parked in the back garden for that reason. Be vigilant, people. I've had some great suggestions and will definitely be hiking up home security. Unless I know who it is, I will never open that door again.
I was about 9 or 10 at the time. It was summer, and I was out riding my skateboard like I always did back then. I stayed on my street since I kept the garage open. So I was riding my skateboard and was just going in the opposite direction of my house. Just then, a car was driving by and I was watching the driver. Now, I would consider myself quite smart for my age, as I knew not to talk to strangers and was always aware of my surroundings. So the car was driving by in the direction of my house. I saw the driver staring at me, and the car slowed down a bit. They drove past my house, but I was still really creeped out. So I grabbed my skateboard and ran inside. One to two hours later, I was headed to the library with my mom. I'd completely forgotten about the man, so I walked outside first. Lo and behold, there he is, parked in front of my house. I ran back inside and waited for my mom. Unsurprisingly, when we came back out, the car was gone. This was almost eight years ago, and to this day, it still creeps me out. I never ended up telling my parents because I didn't want them to worry. But after that, I never saw the car again. When I was about six or seven years old, I had my first international trip to Hong Kong. I was with my mom and her best friend from the university. We arrived around night time, and I was bewildered by the bright lights of the Hong Kong skyline and buzzing energy of the city. On the second day, we traveled to the old part of the city. We had fun enjoying various local eateries and visiting different markets. By the time we finished our lunch and came outside, the streets were jam-packed with people. I'm not sure if there was a festival or some kind of events going on, but people were going shoulder to shoulder on the streets. As we traversed down the street, I held onto my mom's hand as hard as I could, until I lost it. I still don't know exactly why I let go of her hand, or if something made me lose the grip, but when I realized I was at the corner of an intersection in the red light, all by myself, in a country that I don't know the language of. In the state of panic, I frantically yelled out for my mom, but all I got in return were weird looks. Then suddenly, my mother grabbed my hand and we started crossing the road. I was so relieved that I started to cry. I asked where she was, but I didn't get a reply. I thought the noise in the street must have muffled my voice, so I asked her again but she didn't even turn around. That was the moment I noticed the hand I was holding had a red manicure with long fingernails. This wasn't the hand of my mother or her friend. Instantly, I tried to free out of her grasp, but she had an iron grip that was now crushing my hand. I wailed and cried, but nobody gave her a second look. In retrospect, I must have looked like a misbehaving kid throwing a tantrum at his mom. This continued for what feels like hours. By this point, I was being dragged by the stranger to a different alleyway. Then, I heard a voice calling my name. I shouted back, and my mom's friend rushed to where I was. At that moment, the stranger dropped my hand and disappeared into the crowd. Only days later, I realized how bad this could have ended, and my mother's friend literally saved my life. Even to this day, I shiver whenever I see women with bright red manicures on their hands. So this probably happened around 10 to 11 years ago, when I was 15 or 16. For a bit of background, the legal drinking age in my country is 18, so if you want alcohol and didn't have a fake ID, 
or a parent to get it for you. Then you had to hang around the liquor store until someone came by who agreed to go in and purchase the alcohol for you. So we waited around, found someone who was willing to go in and buy alcohol for us, and got him to purchase a few bottles of vodka for me and a few friends, two of which I was with, and the others were meeting after we'd done this. Now, as it was around 6pm, we decided it was too much of a risk to decant our vodka into less suspicious looking bottles in the middle of the street as it was very busy so we did what we would usually do in this situation and found a nearby food place to quickly run in and use the bathroom to decant our alcohol so we could be on our way. This time we chose to do this in a nearby McDonald's we'd done it in before so we knew it was a safe bet. So we go into McDonald's and head straight for the bathroom, as we'd done a million times before. As we get into the bathroom, me and my other two friends all occupy one cubicle to get the job done and get out and back to our drinking ASAP. And as I previously mentioned, we'd done this lots of times before and usually opted to come into this McDonald's as it was usually busy, which meant no one paid attention to three strangers running straight into the toilet without purchasing anything. So anyway, we're all in there doing our thing when I could suddenly hear a lot of shifting and moving around above us. I figured it was possibly the air conditioning and opted not to tell my friends as I thought it would freak them out. We get the job done and as we're about to leave the cubicle, we hear a giggle and... Where are you girls off to? I looked up and I see the forehead and eyes of a male, who look to be about 30, just staring out from underneath a tile in the ceiling that he'd slightly lifted. We were all in shock, just staring at this guy who proceeded to giggle down at us and ask our names, where we were going, and if he could come. We're all in shock because let's be honest, who really expects there to be some random guy in the ceiling of a McDonald's? Being a teenager who thought I was untouchable, I proceeded to tell the guy that he was a perv and a fuck right off. The guy seemed to enjoy this and giggled a little more, still shifting around in the ceiling, never taking his eyes off of us. Now I should probably mention that along with pouring our drink into other bottles, we pre-rolled a few joints, so we were terrified to alert anyone of this as we were young and terrified of our parents finding out. The guy, still staring at us, proceeds to ask questions like, What age are you guys? Where do you live? Can I have some of your drink and a smoke of your weed? Still all the while, twitching and fidgeting overhead. He then started to lift the tile, and as we're all stuck in the cubicle with this guy above us, we knew the only way for him to get down was to come down directly on top of us. So we noped out at that point pretty quickly. We went outside and discussed what we were going to do, and I decided to go back in and alert someone, as it's a very busy McDonald's, and I knew there would be women and children in and out of the toilet until closing time. I didn't want to risk that creep staying up there, just to spy on them, especially since I knew he was there and had witnessed his behavior firsthand. So I go in, tell a member of staff that I'd been in the toilet for a long while, taking a phone call. And that's when the guy had appeared, and to my shock, they were completely unsurprised. They were just pissed off more than anything. I'd seen a few male members of staff enter the toilet, and I figured they could handle it from there. So I went on my way. We still went into that McDonald's, but never had any encounters with Ceiling Guy again. We're not even sure if the guy got caught, as we didn't hear anything about it afterwards. Let me preface this by saying I'm not the most observant human in the world. I'm usually in my own little world and busy planning the rest of my day before I have the chance to enjoy the moment I'm currently in. I'm actively working on this because I'm aware it makes me an easy target. 
Anywho, I don't live in the best part of town, certainly not the worst, but we have our share of shootings, stabbings, and drug-related issues. That said, I feel pretty safe in my apartment complex, as we are in a little nook off a main road, and all of us neighbors know and watch out for each other. A couple of weeks ago, I came home from work, and as I pulled into a parking space, a woman who I'd never seen approached my car. I'm caught off guard. I don't like people approaching me. Hell, I don't particularly like people and talking to people. She started saying she needed a ride. She needed to go to a storage unit just down the road. I'm kind of doing the thing my poor deaf grandma does, where she smiles and nods, while this girl is talking about needing to take stuff to a storage unit and that she's pregnant but I have no clue who the hell she is. I just go home, and I have to take my dog out, and I have things I need to do. That is literally all that's going through my head, because I had my afternoon planned out, and now this lady's talking to me, and I'm getting stressed out because I have a hard time telling people no, all because I'm terrified of disappointing people. Next thing I know, a loud, deep voice snaps me from my mini internal freakout. You're doing alright, Haley. Thank God our property manager had been watching and saw that I was looking uncomfortable. He informed her that she and her friends, who I had not even noticed were hiding between the buildings near the main entrance, needed to leave immediately. So I wonder what would have happened if I had let this girl into my car. Would it have been a totally normal good deed? Or would I have gotten carjacked and ended up getting myself killed? I don't know. But the fact that I didn't pay attention in my own backyard and notice that there was a group of five people that didn't belong just blending in gives me the creeps. So, moral of the story, I need to pay better attention and get worked up over the right things. This happened when I was 17 years old. I'm from Bosnia and used to go fishing with my friends whenever I could. When the summer break began, we used to explore many rivers. Usually we would encounter animals or people, but nothing special. Keep in mind that the legal driving age in Bosnia is 18, so we would usually take a bus to a location or just walk to it. One night, me and my friends sat on a bus and we went to a city not too far away. We arrived to the city and before exiting the bus, an old creepy drunk guy said, Are you boys going fishing? To which I replied, yes, at the lake. He added, well, good luck then. I hope you catch some fish. Followed with a really creepy laugh. Anyway, we arrived at the lake, which was very beautiful, and then we started fishing. At around 1.30, after we had some beers, we could hear arguing in the distance. One of my friends took a flashlight and pointed it in the distance, and as he went over a bush, somebody clearly crouched down. As there were many of us, we weren't really scared. Me and the friend with the flashlight went to investigate while the others stayed near the campfire. Upon arriving in the bush, we spotted the same old drunk guy crawling in the grass. We asked him what he was doing, to which he replied that he was hunting. We didn't see any weapon on him whatsoever. I proceeded to ask him what he was hunting without a weapon. He got up and said, Look, this is a coincidence. I'm gonna get going. While stumbling away. We returned and tried to enjoy the rest of the night. At around 4am, we hear somebody angrily shouting in the distance. We turn around and spot this buff guy in a black shirt, covered in tattoos. Behind him was the old guy. What do you think you're doing on my property? 
he said to us. Sir, we were fishing and didn't know this property was yours. In this argument, I could see my friends packing the fishing rods and all the things we brought. My friends made a run for it in the forest, leaving me and another friend. Okay, you're going to call your friends and tell them to come back, or else you're not leaving, the buff guy said. I, of course, did not want to do that, as I did nothing bad. We were quiet, just talking and doing nothing to disturb anyone. Plus, the river was like 300 meters away from the houses. My friend tells the man we're going and starts to walk. Now, this is where it gets scary. The guy grabs my friend by the neck and starts to argue with him again. I jumped in and hit the guy in the face and started running toward the road. He lets go of my friend and starts to chase after me. After running for about a minute, the guy gets tired. I end up exiting the trees and go onto the street. I wait on a bench for some time and see my friend coming. He sits next to me and tells me that when the guy started chasing me, the old guy jumped on him with a hunting knife. He thankfully missed my friend and he ended up pushing the guy and running as well. We called the cops after that. A patrol came and we gave our statements. We called our other friends and ended up meeting up with them. The cops explained to us that the part where we had been was private property, but again, the fact that the guy grabbed my friend by the neck was not how he should have reacted. We ended up going home, and nowadays, we laugh at this story. Thrifting is my favorite hobby, if you can call it that. It's something I like to do alone when I get the chance, as it's a chance for me to shut my brain off and just let go as I scan aisles crammed with random things for hours. For a side note, I'm a 5 foot 5 former elementary teacher. I'm about as intimidating as a marshmallow, and I'm pretty quiet and stay to myself in public. I had decided to go out of my way to a store I hadn't been to before, and followed my usual routine. When I'm in a store, it's just me and the items. I don't pay any mind to anyone around me, as the stores are crowded and I'm really only there to do my own thing. So, imagine my surprise when an older woman turned to me and said in a huff, Can I help you? I turned and looked around me to make sure I was who she was talking to. I just shook my head, no, making a confused expression and went back to looking at shoes. Things were okay for a minute before I heard her in the next aisle talking to her friend. Oh my god, this creepy woman is following me. Every time I look up, she's there. There was only so much space in the store. I usually go along the edges and then make my way to the center of the store, so there's a good chance she probably just saw me doing my thing. I try to avoid her until I realize she was talking to random people around me about how creepy I was and how I was stalking her. People started giving me funny looks, but paid no mind once they realized how harmless and shrimpy I look. Uh, her? Really? Someone said, yeah, and I'm gonna fuck her up if I see her again. She began making more and more aggressive comments, and I decided I'd had enough. I've never fought anyone in my life, and I wasn't planning to that day. I left my items and went to my car. Yeah, something was up with her, and I wasn't sticking around to find out what it was. So for some background, my parents, sister and I, live in an apartment complex for a final week. It's also been in the news recently for numerous health and property violations. And the new owner is being sued by an unlawfully evicted disabled person 
for stealing his motorized wheelchair. Mice, roaches, ants, and black mold are just some of the issues we've had to deal with on our own because they refuse to. There's gangs, shootings, murders, break-ins, and vehicle damage. We pay $1,850 for a two-bedroom, no washer or dryer. In the lease, it states 24 hours notice before maintenance are allowed to try to enter your house. We've had multiple problems with maintenance, as have others. They often wait until the women, kids, or teens are alone in the house to knock. Today, I was trying to nap due to a severe double ear infection and strong antibiotics. Knocking and the ringing of the doorbell woke me up. This was the conversation. Hi, maintenance. We're cleaning the bathroom fans. Sorry, my parents, the leaseholders, aren't home. I said to the voice coming through the door. Are you 18 or older? You look like it. Yes, I replied. Then we can come in. No, you can't, I said. I close and lock the door, but sit in the living room just in case because maintenance has keys. My mom came home minutes after and I told her the situation. She said she never got an email or letter and she's not comfortable with them being in the house, so I did the right thing. She goes out to get something out of the truck and thank God she locked up behind her because they tried to open the door. My mom comes back and she says to the person, of course you can clean the fan vent, when we're all moved out. The voice just replied with, Oh. My husband and I live in an apartment complex in kind of a shitty neighborhood. Low-income homes and what have you. There are always lots of break-ins, and it's right next to kind of the downtown area of my city. It was mid-April of last year, and I was about seven months pregnant. My husband and I would often go out on our balcony late at night. It was really just the outdoor catwalks of the apartments, which connected the outdoor stairwells and hallways. So it was either very late or very early, depending on your point of view, and it was quite dark. My husband and I were standing outside, looking at the moon over the tops of the apartments. He was smoking. I was unable to sleep due to back pain, the joys of pregnancy. We were chatting about whatever. Suddenly, in the dark before us from the first floor, we heard someone talking. It startled us both, and my husband cocked his head and made a shushing gesture as we both froze. A man's voice, low, was whispering something from the first floor directly below us. I had chills. I couldn't quite hear what he was saying, but it was only his voice, and it sounded like he was having a conversation with himself. As we stood there, both straining to hear him, his voice seemed to be moving away from us. Then we heard the distinct sound of someone shuffling up the stairs. He was climbing the steps to the second floor, slow and deliberately, still muttering. My husband instinctively moved toward me and put out his cigarette as the man rounded the corner onto the outside landing we stood on. He was maybe 35 or 40, but he looked aged in a way I can't really describe. His hair was prematurely gray. He looked really tired at first glance because of his body language, but his eyes were frantic. My husband later told me that he seemed to be high on meth. He was also unexpectedly walking a dog, a very pretty blue healer. He walked right toward us, and my husband stepped in front of me protectively. The dog stopped suddenly, and so did the man as if he had somehow just noticed us. He visibly jumped, then laughed. Hello, 
Oh gosh, I didn't see you there. Pardon me, I'm just walking my little girl. He had the very definition of crazy eyes. They jumped all over the place, and when they landed on me, they jumped immediately to my big belly in almost an angry way. Oh, pregnant. What? I said, sounding like a jerk even to myself. You were pregnant, yeah? My wife, well, ex-wife, she used to be a doula, used to do those things, used to help out ladies and deliver them. Yeah, babies are great. I have two babies. Well, my wife has them. Well, ex-wife, I guess, yeah. It's hard to really convey how he was talking. He sounded really excited, but also weirdly desperate. You could tell maybe he wanted someone to talk to. Now I should mention that I'm a filthy bleeding heart, and my husband is a take-no-shit, look-out-for-number-one kind of guy. He cuts the guy off mid-ramble and says, We were just going inside, man. You have a good night. Sure, sure, I'm sorry. I'm Mike, by the way. I'm Mike. Mike. He sticks out his hand and I shake it. His hands are soaking wet. I almost immediately yank my hand back, and he doesn't even notice. He's taking the dog leash and twisting it weirdly. Every muscle inside of my body is screaming for me to get away from this man. Instead, I tell him my name. At this point, my husband grabs my arm and yanks me towards our apartment, past Mike and the pretty dog. I waddle to the door, and as I open it, look back. Mike is watching me very intently. Once we get inside, we lock the door and talk about him. My husband is insisting he was on meth. He also mentions that it's weird that he's walking his dog. Upstairs... At 3 a.m., when we knew he didn't live in our building, I wrote the guy off as a creepy drug addict, brought our shotgun into the bedroom, and fell asleep. Three nights later, we're outside again. The building across the street from us is another apartment building, and moments after we walk outside, Mike comes out, staring at us, walking his dog. He's smiling weird. He's headed for the stairs. We wave and go back inside and lock the door again. Two days after that, I'm getting out of my car at around 4pm. And he appears. Pretty much at my trunk. One second I was grabbing my stuff to get up. And the next second, he was standing there. There was no dog this time. He engages me in this weird conversation about how he knows my little girl is going to be beautiful, just like me, and how lucky I am, how I have to never, ever get divorced, because it ruins people's lives. I can tell he's extremely depressed. He says his daughter and his wife left him only a few months ago. My husband yells for me from the balcony, and I make a lame excuse and leave Mike to his weird, jittery self. My husband interrogated me on what I said and warned me just to stay away from him. That night, there's a knock at my door. I check my phone and it's like 3.30am. I have a lot of stupid neighbors that like to get wasted, so I decide to wait and see if they knock again. They do, this time more urgently. Feeling hot, fat, pregnant and tired, I poke my husband with my foot and tell him someone's at the door. He continues snoring loudly. I resign myself to getting out of bed. I threw on a robe and trotted out to the front door. Just before unlocking it, I froze. Something told me to check my peephole. An unexpected feeling of dread washed over me. Slowly, I peeked through. At first, I didn't even know what I was looking at. I squinted and tried to focus my vision. 
something didn't look right. It didn't look like the hallway. I rubbed my eyes and looked again. The realization that I was staring directly into Mike's eye hit me, and I swear it felt like liquid ice in my veins. My stomach was in my feet, my breath caught. My hands immediately started pouring sweat. I jumped back from the door and started stumbling backwards. I backed into a wall and hit my head. I tried to catch my breath. Mike knocked again and called my name, softly, like he didn't want to wake anyone, like he knew I was there. He probably did. Looking into the opposite side of the peephole will show no clear images, but will show shadows. I turned around and ran into my bedroom, shut the door, and shook my husband awake. He sat bolt upright and grabbed his shotgun, told me to stay in bed. Gladly. I heard him tell Mike to leave or he was going to call the police, and then silence. Within a minute, my husband came back into the room and said he was gone, that if I heard anything else, to wake him up. I agreed and didn't sleep any more that night. Several weeks passed before we heard from him. In fact, we'd all forgotten about him until our car got broken into. The cops showed up to collect evidence and we told them about Mike, about his creepy behavior and how we suspected him of doing it. They seemed confused until we mentioned his dog and then the officer paled. He asked for a full description of what Mike had done. He wanted a statement. Mike got picked up two nights after the peephole incident for aggravated sexual assault on a pregnant woman in her own home, two buildings down from us. He had extremely bad PTSD from his time in the Corps and was also a meth abuser, just as the husband had predicted. I am so... So glad I checked that stupid people. For a bit of background, I used to live with my good friend in an apartment complex on the sketchier side of town. And with that came the usual crazies, but nothing we couldn't handle except for our next door neighbor. The complex was smaller than a typical one, only two buildings and a shitty pool. We lived on the bottom floor and directly across from us was my neighbor's door with a little walkway in between that would take you to the parking lot of the complex, what he called the vestibule. It was a pretty small space, so if we both came out of our apartments at the same time, then we'd pretty much run into each other. Tim loved his vestibule. He put out flowers and constantly swept to keep it clean. We didn't mind at all, nor paid much attention to it really. Just thought he wanted to keep his apartment looking as nice as it could, which is respectable. We lived in the apartment for two and a half years and never realized how obsessed he was with the vestibule until my girlfriend and I came home from dinner one day and found a note taped to our door. It was written in Sharpie and it looked like a ransom note. The note read in all capitals, no smoking on the vestibule. We pulled the note off the door, confused as to why it was there, when Tim's door flew open and walked right up to us. It was like he was watching the door, waiting for us to come home or something, because there was no way he could have heard us unless he was right next to the door. He looked like he was fuming, yet talked in a soft, calm voice. It was definitely strange, and it put off a very creepy vibe. Did you get my note? You mean this one? I then held up the note to him. Yeah. Did you read it? as he starts moving closer. Uh, yeah, but we don't smoke on the walkway or in the house for that matter. 
We smoke over in the parking lot, so it wasn't us. He then whispers, It's a vestibule. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. It's a vestibule, and I need to clean it, so stop smoking out here. With that, he does a 180 and slams his door behind him. We were stunned to say the least. I've barely ever talked to this guy in the last two years, except the simple hey when we happened to cross paths in the parking lot or on the vestibule so it freaked us out to say the least. We went inside, chalked it up to, this place is full of crazies, and forgot about it. We watched a movie, drank a bit, and then went to bed. The next morning was a Monday, so I left in the morning for work. My roommate had already left as well, so it was just my girlfriend in the apartment. She worked afternoons, so she usually wouldn't text me until about noon and I never really texted her first so she could sleep. But that day, she never texted me. 12.30 rolls around, so I text her first, thinking she's gotta be up by now, and probably forgot or something. And that's when my heart sank. She responded to my, Hey, good morning, with, He's trying to break in. I quickly call her a couple of times, and she's not picking up, so now I'm freaking out. I run to my boss, let him know someone's breaking into my house, and he lets me go. I'm calling and calling, but she won't pick up. I decide to call my roommate and let him know someone is breaking in, so he's on his way too. I'm thinking she's been hurt or something, when she finally calls me back. She'd been on the phone with the police. When I pick up the phone, she's hysterical, crying and incoherent. I calm her down enough to figure out what's wrong. She says that someone's pounding on the door and twisting the handle, and she thinks it's the neighbor. He hadn't broken in yet, but he's yelling and screaming, while kicking the door over and over so loud, I can hear it through the phone. He's not screaming words either, just crazy loud yelling. I'm furious to say the least, and speeding to get home. I stay on the phone with my girlfriend the entire time, to make sure she's okay. When I get there, I see the police walking away from my apartment. I rush up to them and tell them I'm the owner of the apartment. I try explaining the situation. They respond, saying they tried knocking on the door, but no one answered. Yeah, you dumbass. Why would she open the door for knocking when he was knocking too? I wanted to say that, but I just asked that they talk to him and that I wanted to press charges. They said they'll take a report and left. They didn't even come back to make sure my girlfriend was okay. I walk over and he's not there anymore just boot marks on my door, and a note taped to my door that reads in red sharpie this time, no smoking on the fucking vestibule. The note was horrifying, like a mental patient in an asylum wrote it. Instead of a single piece of tape holding it up, it was taped on every single side. I rip it off and go inside to find my girlfriend hiding in the closet sitting there bawling her eyes out. I comfort her and get her some water. My roommate comes through the door at this point and looks mad. I show him the note and we both go over to confront him. As soon as we exit the house, he opens his door, meaning once again, he was probably watching us. Did you get my note? Fuck your note. Who the fuck do you think you are? trying to break into my house. What do you mean? I just put the note up. No, you were pounding on the door and jiggling the handle trying to get in. Well, I knocked, but definitely didn't pound on your door or anything. My girlfriend was in there and is shaken up because you were trying to break in, and I could hear you through the fucking phone screaming. This is where he froze and I realized that he didn't think anyone was home. He just said, 
no smoking on the vestibule, and shuffled back to his apartment. My roommate yelled, fuck your vestibule, and kicked his door, which I found pretty funny. Our guess was that he thought he could get away with kicking and trying to break down our door, and realized we knew it was him. It made us wonder how many times he tried to kick our door in when we weren't home. My girlfriend didn't leave the house properly for about a week after that, using her vacation time because she couldn't bring herself to go outside alone in the chance he would be there. A few days later, his wife, who I'd never seen in my life, came over and explained that he was schizophrenic and that he has OCD, so he takes the vestibule very seriously. She then asked if she could use my oven to make brownies with a big, creepy smile, instilling into my mind that these people are out of their minds. I told her absolutely not that the two of them need to stay the fuck away from anyone that comes in and out of this apartment. If he yells at even one more person that we're gonna call the police and then slam the door in her face. I was just so angry and furious. I was tired of dealing with all these creeps and weirdos, and now it was affecting the lives of my loved ones, so I decided I need a change and found a new place shortly after all of this, and moved out last month. My roommate followed suit. He moved out this month, leaving behind that hellhole for good. I haven't seen him since, and hope that whoever moves into that place doesn't smoke on the vestibule because God help them if they do. We moved a lot when I was a kid, but through high school I always used the same bus stop. It was about a half a block away where our quiet suburban street intersected with a slightly busier one. I was often there alone, early in the morning. For the longest time, the most interesting thing that might happen was a raven scolding me from a tree, or that a family deer would follow me from the park across the street from my house to the bus stop through the fog, and pass me to walk into the forest preserve beyond the intersection. It was a quiet neighborhood, and only a handful of cars might pass by while I waited for the bus. The deer stopped following me after the harassment began. That morning, a jeep suddenly hit the brakes and slowed down to a stop in front of me. The driver had all the windows rolled down, even though it was a chilly, wet autumn morning. One of those days where the mist just clings to and saturates everything and the clouds are so low in the sky, and you would feel like the world is just a big room that you're in. Because of the fog, they hadn't seen me until they were a few meters away, and their braking made a screeching sound. They stopped the car, and the driver just sat there, staring straight ahead. I couldn't make them out. They were wearing a light gray hooded sweatshirt and sunglasses, I didn't see anyone else in the car. After about 30 tense seconds, during which my bemusement gave way to concern that someone was going to hit this guy, stopped in the road. He finally turned to me, yelled a racial slur, smiled, and took off. I didn't think much of it at the time. I'm newish to the area. I'm not great with faces and I figured it was one of the kids at the high school trying to be edgy, or maybe just a local asshole. Either way, I didn't think about it at all until the next week, when it happened again. This time, the guy had friends with him. The windows were tinted and they only cracked them, so I couldn't see them. He yelled a different slur at me, and I could hear their laughter as they drove off. This continued to happen, sometimes twice in a week, sometimes going months in between. They sounded young, 
so I continued to write it off as another weird local hazing ritual. But gradually, it began to get under my skin. There were two things that bothered me about it. First, the slurs. They were ugly and hateful, and they sounded promisingly violent to me. Second, their license plate was obscured every time. This is a very wealthy area I'm describing, and the local law enforcement wouldn't call out anyone who lived there on a violation, so I wasn't surprised that they got away with it. But it did give me pause. One morning, I was ready to yell back at them, but instead of yelling anything, they just swerved at my location on the sidewalk. I jumped out of the way and ran behind a fence, but the jeep ended up whipping through there where I'd been standing before speeding off. I figured the kid had overshot and hadn't actually meant to hurt me, but some of the things that followed have since made me wonder. One morning, I came to the bus stop and there was just blood all over the area where I usually stood. It was wet from the rain, but otherwise congealing, turning dark in places. But I knew what it was. It wasn't a huge amount of blood, but it was off-putting. A few days later, there was a dead animal there, mangled and brutalized. It wasn't roadkill. I couldn't take my eyes off of it, even after getting on the bus. It wasn't there when I returned in the afternoon. It wasn't an accident. I feel certain about that. It looked to me as though it had been stabbed repeatedly. Extreme overkill. I started to see the jeep outside of the morning bus stop, but the windows were never down now, and it always sped off when I looked at it. Or I otherwise couldn't get to it before it left. This carried on for years. One day in the summer, I was walking through my neighborhood with a friend, and the jeep came by at a very high speed and an egg hit me in the chest. It flowed down my shirt and onto my pants, and all I could think to do was turn to my friend James and say, You saw that, right? Because up until then, nobody else had ever witnessed the events, and my family members seemed skeptical when I mentioned it. I had to go home and change my clothes and take a shower. Since the egg hit me at such a high speed, that it went into my hair and everywhere. It was then that I started to take the situation more seriously. I had a bruise for weeks. I started to catch a ride with my brother in the mornings or wait behind the local NFL player's fence until I heard the bus coming down the street. I didn't ever go outside until I had text confirmation that my ride was there. If I heard a car coming on a walk, I would run off into the bushes. They swerved at me a few more times, and then I never saw them again. Some other strange things happened, and I've had stalkers since, but I've never been able to connect them to these events, nor figure out who the people in the Jeep were, or where they lived. My parents have moved to a different part of the community now, but I'm still jumpy when I walk around in the area. Shortly after moving into my first apartment, I started having strange encounters with one of my neighbors on laundry night. I would pass through my neighbor's carport when it rained to get to the laundromat. He stood in the shadows a bit and startled me several times, possibly avoiding the rain. I tried to be friendly, but he would just stare at me, smoking his cigarettes and not say a word. Soon, it became a regular routine for him, and then the apartment across the way opened up and he moved to that one. I changed laundry to a daytime only event. One night, I sat on my stoop on the phone and noticed a red light in the distance. It was him sitting in the dark with a video camera pointed straight at me. I went inside to tell my friend, who had just been crashing at my place for a few weeks. I was freaked out and relieved about the timing of them staying. 
That night, my friend staying with me went out, and when he was gone, I heard loud bangs. They sounded far away, but I used a sound machine to help me sleep, so I couldn't be sure what it was. The next day, leaving, we noticed the wood on the door around the deadbolt was all mashed up. I asked him if he'd noticed it when he came back, but it was late and he was a little drunk, so he wasn't sure. The maintenance people were very concerned because it looked like someone had tried to break in while I was home alone. Shortly after that, I left and got a new apartment. Luckily, my new roommate had an amazing big dog, and when she was out of town one night, I woke up at like 3 a.m. to him growling at her window. I went over and ensured it was locked. The next day, my neighbors asked me if I locked myself out. I said no. Why? Sure enough, the screen door on the outside was all twisted, as if someone tried to get in and got interrupted by a very big dog. The worst part was, I had out-of-state plates, and all my friends kept telling me to get switched because I was sticking out to the police. I often thought that he tracked me down by plates and tried again, or maybe I was just paranoid, and these were a series of break-ins looking for money, jewelry, and that kind of thing. I've got one of those lives that need to be the plotline for a New York Times bestseller or some movie. But anyways, after I've moved away from my manipulative leeching roommates, I moved into a small apartment by myself, working on my credit, working on buying furniture and the like. But now I'm starting to think I'm being watched by folks. A few weeks after I moved in, I heard an argument going on outside across the street. Nothing too out of the ordinary, because folks get into it from time to time, right? The complex is calm and quiet otherwise. However, I peeped outside my blinds to see what was going on, and I believe someone saw me checking it out. I can't see much because of foliage by my window. A couple of days after that, I went to take the trash out to the dumpster, and I could see two people standing out front, near where the argument happened, and they took like three pictures. It wasn't that late, and I could tell because they had flash on. They then went inside, and I didn't see anything weird for a while. However, yesterday I went outside to take out the trash then saw this guy in a white car with black tinted windows and his driver's side window all the way down. He was leering at me. Now, I was wearing a short dress, so I thought maybe it was my clothing, but then I realized that the paint on my car was also white. The look was kind of smug, but I didn't know them personally, so I don't know if I'd be judging their demeanor properly. One day I got back from the grocery store and didn't even finish putting them back before a guy from that side of the complex came walking in my direction with some kind of contraption in their hand that sounded almost like a machine gun and had smoke coming out of it. I didn't want to get too close because it seemed odd and timely given that I just got back. Then I saw the white car again come zooming towards my direction. I just got my keys out and ran back inside. I took a break to put groceries up before getting the last load because it seemed like they may have been waiting out. Then, a few minutes later, on the opposite side of my apartment, I could see a white car with black tinted windows stopped in an angle where they could possibly see my apartment from a rear window. It's possible they think I called the police for the argument or for the car scratch, but I'm not sure if I'm just paranoid or if I'm actually being scoped out. And if so, I'm not sure what it means for me or what I would need to do to prevent it. 
I work from home, so I can just stay inside most of the week and get groceries and food delivered as needed. Yesterday, I set up my cameras and saw a teenager with a toy machine gun stood outside of my window and bush with a group of kids sitting right across from where I would be seen if I come out. They weren't doing anything suspicious at the time, just hanging around but it still looked like they may have been interested in seeing me leave. I got three knocks on my door yesterday too, with no one at the peephole, not even walking away. Today, the guy who had the metal canister looking thing came back by walking a dog and talking on his phone. When I looked out the window, it looked like he dipped behind a tree then walked back in his direction. The tree was just directly in eyesight of my door. He didn't even bother to go further through with the dog. Just enough to be right by the entrance. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you can't get enough Mr. Revenant content, check out the perks of my Patreon and channel membership. Details are in the description. I'd like to thank my channel members and patrons for the support. Brooke, Snowball Rathena, Janice, Dez, Borderline Betty, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Stacy, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Samantha, Zepp, Sarah C, Casey, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Erin, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire05, Jody, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I will see you on the next one.